Earlier this year, in the wake of mass demonstrations across the United States protesting police brutality and racism, residents brought attention to centuries of oppression by vandalizing and in some cases dismantling statues of historical figures involved in said oppression. Initially, the most notable statues of historical figures taken down were those of Confederate generals and politicians. Supporters of these monuments include conservatives, centrists with unexamined beliefs, outright racists, white supremacists, as well as pundits and politicians who see defending these statues as a wedge issue that can be used in their favor, all of whom hereafter, for the sake of brevity, will be called traditionalists, status quo social conservatives, or counter-revolutionary reactionaries. Traditionalism is the rejection of modernism or modernity. Anything that upsets tradition, even traditions based in falsehoods, is the enemy of the good. Italian philosopher and professor Umberto Eco once described this cult of tradition thusly, As a consequence of traditionalism, there can be no advancement of learning. Truth has already been spelled out once and for all, and we can only keep interpreting its obscure message. Traditionalists tend to dodge the politics and intentions of having these monuments in public places like parks. The motivations are revealed by looking at when there was a spike in the number of these monuments created. Post-Civil War, there have been two such spikes. The first spike in Confederate monuments began in the early 20th century around the time of the renewal of the Ku Klux Klan in the South and an epidemic of lynchings of black Americans. The second spike in Confederate monuments in the 1950s and 1960s coincided with the civil rights movement to end segregation in the South. Monuments are not built through some form of historical impartiality or neutrality. Monuments are built to glorify. Monuments are built for a purpose, to honor specific individuals and the ideals that they represent. When traditionalists claim that dismantling them destroys history, they are obfuscating the true purpose of these monuments because they are never built to be history books. History books are history books. History books are meant to educate. Monuments are meant to glorify. Maintaining these monuments does not preserve history because these monuments, if anything, either obscure history or tell only a certain version of that history. They whitewash history. They glorify inglorious people. Supporters of these monuments ignore the motivations for their creation and claim instead that these monuments exist only for Southern pride. A dog whistle in and of itself, but also a failing argument. Because if the chiefest historical figures who exemplify Southern pride are slave owners and men who otherwise assisted in the defense of slavery and white supremacy, then that tells us everything we need to know about whoever is saying Southern pride. Supporters of these monuments then use a different example to defend preserving something for historical purposes. Auschwitz. After all, it stands to this day, but there is a key difference. Auschwitz exists to remind people that this must never happen again. That is the motivation behind maintaining it, and what people come away with after visiting it. Monuments to Confederate generals and politicians were not built to remind people in the South that the South must never rise again, or to shame Southerners in their own public parks. Auschwitz condemns. Confederate monuments glorify. They are presented heroically. To claim otherwise would either be naive or said in bad faith. Removing monuments and bringing attention to the oppression of those removing them is not a threat to history. It is a threat to traditionalism. A threat to the reactionary movement against modern thinking. If anything, these protesters are making history. They bring attention to history, the real history. This is not mere vandalism, it is a statement about the obfuscation of oppression, the effects of which are obviously still being felt if protesters feel so compelled to point them out so brazenly. Recently, in an effort to reorient the conversation, defenders of these monuments and other monuments created a new talking point to be repeated in conservative media and in the discourse among the public. They say, if the criteria for taking down a statue is that the subject of the statue owned slaves, then what's next? Taking down the statues of the Founding Fathers? Denigrating the memory of the Founding Fathers? This is an attempt to shame protesters into stopping and to win the debate. If the protesters concede the point that the Founding Fathers' statues should remain and that their memory should not be denigrated, then the protesters' motivations and criteria become confused and even hypocritical. 
Unconcerned with right-wing pundits who will never take their objections seriously anyway, the protesters have proven that they were not bluffing. Statues of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson have been removed by protesters. Again, this is not vandalism for the sake of vandalism. It is an attempt to reorient the conversation yet again to the objections of the protesters, such as objections to policies of over-policing in minority neighborhoods, police brutality against minorities, and indeed the institution of the modern, centralized police itself. A statue being removed is only a minor victory. Instead, the statue being removed is the rallying cry for people to pay attention to the other related demands. Even beyond these demands, attention should be brought to the history of the Founding Fathers, not only because they were old slave owners, although that should be enough, but because the entire narrative about their intentions and actions in creating the United States is not history, but mythology. Traditionalism has consequences. Myths have consequences, and these myths must be dismantled as much as any statue. So, who even were the Founding Fathers, and what did they do? Historians disagree on who is considered a Founding Father or not, but most agree that at the very least, early presidents like George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison meet the largely subjective criteria, as well as figures who were not president like Benjamin Franklin and a few others. The Founding Fathers used their power and influence to declare independence from the British Empire and coordinate a revolution. Traditionalists paint the Founding Fathers as philosopher soldiers of the Enlightenment, who boldly defended the colonists from tyranny. The truth is that, for the most part, the Founding Fathers were rich white men who used their wealth to consolidate power first in the colonies and then as leaders of their own nation. The American Revolutionary War was fought to maintain the present and future business interests of said Founding Fathers. A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn put it best, Around 1776, certain important people in the English colonies made a discovery that would prove enormously useful for the next 200 years. They found that by creating a nation, a symbol, a legal unity called the United States, they could take over land, profits, and political power from favorites of the British Empire. In the process, they could hold back a number of potential rebellions and create a consensus of popular support for the rule of a new, privileged leadership. When we look at the American Revolution this way, it was a work of genius and the Founding Fathers deserve the awed tribute that they have received over the centuries. They created the most effective system of national control devised in modern times and showed future generations of leaders the advantages of combining paternalism with command. Much like today, the late 18th century was a time of economic disparity. A study of city taxes by historian Gary Nash shows that the top 5% of city taxpayers controlled 49% of Boston's taxable assets. In Philadelphia and New York, wealth was similarly concentrated, or more concentrated. The citizenry took issue with some of the taxes imposed by the Crown, but they also took issue with the wealthy elite in general, including the wealthy colonists. Revolution against the British Empire was not a popular idea. Historian John Shy estimated only 20% of the population wanted war against the king. Many of those in the 20% in favor were the wealthy who would stand to benefit the most from an independent nation and be safest when the fighting broke out. The wealthy, the founding fathers among them, had several reasons for wanting the revolution. First, no longer being taxed by the British Empire would obviously increase their already sizable fortunes and make way for new, untaxed business ventures. Second, the British Empire made a pact with Native Americans in 1763 that forbade westward expansion beyond the Appalachians. The wealthy elite wanted to ignore this proclamation, expand west, and drive out the Native Americans. Third, there was concern that recent rumblings of slavery abolition from Britain could foster abolition in the colonies as well. The growing abolition movement in the empire actually moved slower than the wealthy colonists predicted, beginning in earnest with the British Slave Trade Act in 1807, but not complete until the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833. Nevertheless, this was a fear among the wealthy elite in the colonies at the time, and with so many of the Founding Fathers being slave owners, a revolution would protect them from any foreign decree of abolition. Fourth, a growing resentment among the poor encouraged the Founding Fathers to direct that anger toward the Crown and not themselves. Again, from A People's History of the United States, 
We have here a forecast of the long history of American politics, the mobilization of lower class energy by upper class politicians, for their own purposes. This was not purely deception, it involved, in part, a genuine recognition of lower class grievances which helps to account for its effectiveness as a tactic over the centuries. In the countryside where most people lived, there was a similar conflict of poor against rich, one which political leaders would use to mobilize the population against England, granting some benefits for the rebellious poor and many more for themselves in the process. Small rebellions and mob actions took place that threatened the wealthy elite. In 1765, a shoemaker named Ebenezer McIntosh led a mob that destroyed the house of a rich Boston merchant named Andrew Oliver. Two weeks later, the crowd turned to the home of Thomas Hutchinson. There were tenant uprisings in New York and New Jersey. Mechanics were demanding political democracy in the colonial cities like Philadelphia. Laborers, artisans, and small tradesmen, when electoral politics failed them, took control of the city. Amid a series of smaller revolutions, the Founding Fathers saw an American revolution against the king as the best way to hold on to their power. The soldiers of the revolution were primarily the poor. Some were even drifters who, having no other options, took up the cause. Historian John Shy said of this, America contained a large and growing number of fairly poor people, and many of them did much of the actual fighting and suffering between 1775 and 1783. A very old story. During the Revolution, facing unequal pay and few supplies, many soldiers mutinied. Farmers and vagrants who enlisted in the Revolution and expected to get something out of it found that, as enlisted men, they would receive only $6.66 a month, while someone born into more advantages and given the rank of colonel would receive $75 a month. Despite promises, the class structure did not radically change following victory in the war. Independence did, however, create the richest ruling class in history, with enough scraps left over for the middle class to act as a buffer between the rich and the poor. In short, the Founding Fathers were wealthy men who started a war for their own self-interests. As it was many other times in world history, the poor fought and died for the interests of the wealthy. So, those are the broad strokes, but individually, who were the Founding Fathers? When George Washington passed away, a minister and huckster named Mason Locke Weems wrote a biography of the late president, filled with completely invented myths to help sell the book. It was called The Life of George Washington with Curious Anecdotes, Equally Honorable to Himself and Exemplary to His Young Countrymen. It helped mythologize Washington to the people of the still young country. Never did the wise Ulysses take more pains than with his beloved Telemachus, than with Mr. Washington with George to inspire him with an early love of truth. The book contains, among other things, the cherry tree myth in which young George Washington chopped down a tree and when confronted with what he had done, confessed, saying, I cannot tell a lie. None of this happened. However, these small lies, these small myths, are nothing compared to the grander myths about Washington. That he was a humble man, that he desired liberty for all, and that he single-handedly saved the fledgling nation from the tyranny of the hated British, earning himself the moniker, Father of Our Country. George Washington did not have humble beginnings. He was a child of incredible privilege and wealth. His great-great-grandfather, Lawrence Washington, spent his childhood at the family residence, Soulgrave Manor, near Banbury in Oxfordshire. Lawrence's son, John, left England for the New World to make his fortune in tobacco. Once there, John was recruited to fight Native Americans in Maryland, and through his social mobility and wealth, earned a rank of colonel. John slaughtered five Native American emissaries and cheated tribes out of their land, atrocities that won him the Native American nickname of Kanatakarius, which roughly translates as either destroyer of villages or town devourer. John took advantage of a loophole in British law that allowed 50 acres to each immigrant. John imported 63 indentured servants from England to the New World, amassing their acres for himself. In time, he had more than 5,000 acres, including the future site of Mount Vernon. Generations later, George Washington was born into one of the wealthiest families in the colonies, a fortune amassed by cheating indentured servants out of their land, and later cultivated by African slaves. When Washington was 11 years old, he inherited 10 slaves from the estate of his father, Augustine. 
Lest one think this was only thrust upon him and that he should not be shamed for the sins of his father, George Washington continued to acquire slaves throughout his entire life, some more through inheritance and others through his own direct purchases. He married the wealthy widow Martha Dandridge Custis, bringing in over 80 more slaves to the estate at Mount Vernon, a total of almost 150. Based on Washington's own words, he held his slaves in great contempt. According to Washington, A Life, by Ron Chernow, Slavery presented special challenges to a hypercritical personality like Washington, for the slaves had no earthly reason to strive for the perfection he wanted. However illogical it might seem, he expected them to share his work ethic, and was perturbed when they didn't follow his industrious example. Not surprisingly, his letters contain frequent references to slaves, whom he saw as indolent or prone to theft, and he never regarded such behavior as rational responses to bondage. Reproaching his slave carpenters, he said, There is not to be found so idle a set of rascals. Of a slave named Betty, who worked as a spinner in the mansion, he complained that a more lazy, deceitful, and impudent hussy is not to be found in the United States. He talked caustically about malingering slaves as if they were salaried workers who had failed to earn their wages, a blind spot he never entirely lost. Before this, Washington's wealth and political maneuvering earned him the rank of lieutenant colonel in the Virginia Regiment, and by most accounts, he was unqualified for this position, as he had never seen combat before. On May 28, 1754, Washington led British soldiers and Native American allies, specifically the Mingo people, to the encampment of French ensign Joseph Coron de Jamonvilliers. When Washington's forces reached Jamonvilliers' camp, they attacked, killing him and several of his soldiers, as well as taking others prisoner. Jamonvilliers was actually there at the behest of French Canadians to warn Washington not to encroach on French territory and to maintain the peace. A Mingo warrior later confessed that it was Washington who fired first. This novice assault and foolhardy catastrophe eventually led to the Seven Years' War among five of the world's great powers, widely understood by historians to be the first conflict that could be called a world war. An estimated 1.4 million people died in this war because George Washington did not know what he was doing. In 1775, when the Continental Congress created its Continental Army, Washington was chosen to be Commander-in-Chief. Washington was chosen over John Hancock because Congress believed a Virginian would be a more uniting figure. Another quality that almost certainly helped his chances at this promotion was that by this point, Washington was the richest man in America. It may have helped. As the American Revolutionary War began, a proposal was given to Washington that would increase their chances against the British. Black slaves offered to join the revolutionary cause in exchange for freedom. In many counties, slaves were 25% of the population, and in a few counties as much as 50%. Washington flatly turned this down, as it would mean potentially losing his slaves and therefore the maintenance of his wealth. Abolition could have happened right then and there in 1776, but continued for another century in the United States due to Washington's self-interest. Another potential ally, Native Americans, was lost when it became clear to many of the tribes that one reason for the revolution in the first place was to advance west. Certainly not all, but a great many. The popular image of Washington at this time is valiantly crossing the Delaware River and charging into battle, but the commander-in-chief of the army was just that. He was kept in relative safety while frontline infantrymen did the fighting and dying. Of the approximately 230 battles and skirmishes in the Revolutionary War, Washington was present for only 17 of them, and again kept in relative safety. Of these skirmishes, he led his side to victory only 6 out of 17 times. Far more helpful than one single man were the allies to the colonies, Spain, the Netherlands, and especially France. More than 7,000 French soldiers died to earn independence for the United States. French involvement in the war is widely understood by historians to be among the most decisive contributions to victory. Washington's relationship with slavery became even more complicated and more disastrous as he aged, and especially as he ascended the presidency. According to New York Times journalist Erica Armstrong Dunbar, President Washington actually went to great lengths to maintain his ownership of his slaves. During the president's two terms in office, the Washingtons relocated first to New York and then to Philadelphia. Although slavery had steadily declined in the North, the Washingtons decided that they could not live without it, 
Once settled in Philadelphia, Washington encountered his first roadblock to slave ownership in the region, Pennsylvania's Gradual Abolition Act of 1780. The act began dismantling slavery, eventually releasing people from bondage after their 28th birthdays. Under the law, any slave who entered Pennsylvania with an owner and lived in the state for longer than six months would be set free automatically. This presented a problem for the new president. Washington developed a canny strategy that would protect his property and allow him to avoid public scrutiny. Every six months, the president's slaves would travel back to Mount Vernon or would journey with Mrs. Washington outside the boundaries of the state. In essence, the Washingtons reset the clock. As president, Washington supported policies that protected slave owners and used his presidential powers to both maintain his own slave owning and seek out runaway slaves. In 1793, Washington signed the first Fugitive Slave Law, which allowed slaves to be seized in any state, tried, and returned to their owners. In 1796, Ona Judge, the Washington's 22-year-old slave woman, escaped from Philadelphia. This was provoked by Martha Washington's plan to give Ona Judge away as a wedding gift to her granddaughter. President Washington and his agents pursued Judge for three years, but she managed to avoid recapture for the rest of her life. As president, Washington was actually wildly unpopular. When the United States instituted a hefty tax on whiskey, citizens first petitioned, then peacefully protested, and then finally burned down a tax supervisor's house. In the book, You Never Forget Your First, Alexis Coe wrote, According to the Constitution, the commander-in-chief could send in troops only at the request of state officials, and Pennsylvania Governor Thomas Mifflin wasn't ready to take that step. Washington saw a rebellion, but Mifflin saw isolated and largely whiskey-fueled acts of desperation from a community that felt unheard. Mifflin didn't make excuses for the rebels, but he believed that the courts should decide how to resolve this impasse. Washington did not. In an extraordinary showing of executive overreach, he sidestepped both Mifflin and the Constitution, securing a judicial writ from Associate Justice James Wilson, called out state militia for federal service, and hired a tailor to make him a uniform modeled after the one he'd worn in the war. He became the first and only president to take up arms against his own citizens. Washington even lost his popularity among the other founding fathers. John Adams in 1812 wrote that Washington was too illiterate, unlearned, unread for his station and reputation. Incidentally, Adams was one of the few early presidents who never owned any slaves. Thomas Paine, in a letter to Washington in 1779, declared, I shall never suffer a hint of dishonor or even a deficiency of respect to you to pass unnoticed. Then in 1796, Paine wrote, The world will be puzzled to decide whether you are an apostate or an imposter, whether you have abandoned good principles, or whether you ever had any. As for the mythology surrounding him, George Washington was not a humble man. He was a man of privilege. He did not desire liberty for all, as the American Revolution disproportionately benefited the wealthy, and he kept men and women enslaved on his property until the day he died. He did not save the United States from the British. It would be more accurate to say the poor he recruited or enlisted did the work, not to mention the French allies. If he was father of our country, he was a stern disciplinarian at best, and an abusive father at worst. The Jeffersons came to the New World in 1612. A Jefferson was listed among the delegates in an assembly at Jamestown in 1619. Thomas Jefferson's great-grandfather was a planter who married the daughter of a justice in Charles City County. He died around 1698, leaving an estate of land, slaves, and livestock. Thomas Jefferson, like many of the other founding fathers, was born into wealth. His father, Peter Jefferson, amassed huge tracts of land in Virginia. According to John Meacham, author of Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, Thomas Jefferson was therefore born to a high rank of colonial society and grew up as the eldest son of a prosperous, cultured, and sophisticated family. They dined with silver, danced with grace, entertained constantly. Jefferson believed his first memory was of being handed up to a slave on horseback and carried, carefully, on a pillow for a long journey, an infant white master being cared for by someone whose freedom was not his own. Throughout the course of his life, Jefferson would own as many as 600 slaves, many of whom were born into slavery rather than purchased directly. 
Jefferson is perhaps best known as the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, but another work of his, entitled Notes on the State of Virginia, was actually the most consumed non-fiction book in the United States well into the 19th century. In its pages, Jefferson wrote a series of contradictory assessments of his slaves and of black people in general. According to Ibram X. Kendi, author of Stamped from the Beginning, With notes on the state of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson emerged as the preeminent American authority on black intellectual inferiority. This status would persist over the next 50 years. Jefferson did not mention the innumerable enslaved Africans who learned to be highly intelligent blacksmiths, shoemakers, bricklayers, coopers, carpenters, engineers, manufacturers, artisans, musicians, farmers, midwives, physicians, overseers, house managers, cooks, and buy-in trilingual translators. All of the workers who made his Virginia plantation and many others almost entirely self-sufficient. Jefferson had to ignore his own advertisements for skilled runaways and the many advertisements from other planters calling for the return of their valuable skilled captives who were remarkably smart and sensible and very ingenious at any work. One wonders whether Jefferson really believed his own words. Did Jefferson really believe black people were smart in slavery but stupid in freedom? Notes on the State of Virginia was replete with other contradictory ideas about black people. In Jefferson's vivid imagination, lazy blacks desired to sleep more than whites, but as physical savants, they required less sleep. People are often taught that mere ignorance produces racist ideas, and then people just institute racist policies by mistake. This is not historical. It is actually the inverse. Racist policies lead to justifications for racism, which help propagate ignorance and hate. Racist ideas do not reach positions of power from the people. It is instead positions of power that spread racism to the people. Again from Ibram X. Kendi. This is the causal relationship driving America's history of race relations. Their own racist ideas usually did not dictate the decisions of the most powerful Americans when they instituted, defended, and tolerated discriminatory policies that affected millions of black lives over the course of American history. Racially discriminatory policies have usually sprung from economic, political, and cultural self-interests. Self-interests that are constantly changing. Politicians seeking higher office have primarily created and defended discriminatory policies out of political self-interest, not racist ideas. Capitalists seeking to increase profit margins have primarily created and defended discriminatory policies out of economic self-interest, not racist ideas. Cultural professionals, including theologians, artists, scholars, and journalists, were seeking to advance their careers or cultures and have primarily created and defended discriminatory policies out of professional self-interest, not racist ideas. Discriminatory policies come from the top, not from the bottom. In 1785, Thomas Jefferson became the United States Minister to France. When Jefferson was 44 years old in 1787, he requested that 14-year-old Sally Hemings, born into slavery in the Jefferson estate, accompany him in Paris. He impregnated her. Let this be abundantly clear. It is not possible to have a consensual relationship between a master and a slave. Someone being held captive, in this case since birth, cannot give consent for the same reason someone who has been kidnapped cannot give consent, or why a child cannot give consent, or why someone with a weapon to their throat cannot give consent. The extreme and violent power dynamics do not make consent possible. Whatever conversation passed between Jefferson and Hemings is irrelevant. When a man has sex with a human being he owns or has captured, it is forced, no matter the circumstance. In the words of journalist Constance Grady, By all accounts, Jefferson's sexual relationship with Hemings spanned several decades, beginning when Hemings was a teenager and Jefferson was in his 40s. It was not, in any sense of the word, consensual. Hemings was a child, and Jefferson literally owned her. She was not in any position to give or withhold consent. What Jefferson did to Hemings was rape as it becomes more and more difficult to ignore the fact that he repeatedly raped a child whom he owned, he's gone from American demigod to American demon. 
In 1801, Jefferson became the third president of the United States. His administration is best known among traditionalists for the Louisiana Purchase, which greatly expanded U.S. territory. Among critics, President Jefferson is known for foolishly taking advice from his Secretary of State, James Madison. James Madison's great-grandfather John came to the New World in 1653. He took advantage of the same law granting acres to a man and his servants as Washington's ancestor did. In other words, while the law was helpful to anyone moving to the colonies, it was significantly more helpful to men who had indentured servants to increase the total of acres. The rich became richer. Madison was born into an inheritance of over 100 slaves and freed only one, albeit indirectly, selling this slave named Billy to someone else who eventually freed him seven years later. In Philadelphia on May 25, 1787, the Constitutional Convention began. James Madison is known as the father of the Constitution because of his pivotal role in the document's drafting and ratification. He drafted the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights, but he had a more infamous role in the Constitution, the Three-Fifths Compromise. The Three-Fifths Compromise was a pact to determine how black slaves should be counted among the population, again from Ibram X. Kendi. Equating enslaved blacks to three-fifths of all other white persons matched the ideology of racists on both sides of the aisle. Both assimilationists and segregationists argued, yet with different premises and conclusions, that black people were simultaneously human and subhuman. Assimilationists stridently declared the capability of sub-white, subhuman blacks to become whole five-fifths white one day. For segregationists, three-fifths offered a mathematical approximation of inherent and permanent black inferiority. They may have disagreed on the rationale and the question of permanence, but seemingly all embraced black inferiority, and in the process enshrined the power of slaveholders and racist ideas in the nation's founding document. In 1806, when Madison was Secretary of State, Napoleon issued a decree saying that any ships suspected of trading with Britain would be seized by the French Navy, the British declared that any ships suspected of trading with France would be seized by the British Navy. The British Navy began boarding American ships, leading to Madison's terrible idea, the Embargo of 1807. Madison wrongly believed that depriving the world's greatest powers of the trade of one solitary nation would force them to capitulate. This was a massive overestimation of the fledgling United States' worth to other nations. The Embargo made things much worse. Secretary Madison sold President Jefferson on this embargo idea. Plenty of blame to go around. Without the benefit of foreign trade, the American economy almost collapsed. Once Madison was the fourth president of the United States, he was outmaneuvered by both Britain and France. Madison then got the bright idea that he would invade Canada and then hold it hostage for concessions. It did not go well, and the British burned Washington on August 24, 1814. The British eventually relented, not hoping to gain anything from the colonies, and the United States barely held on to its independence. Traditionalists fear the exposition of their whitewashed version of the past. They don't want to see James Madison as the man who almost lost the United States. They want to see him as the father of the Constitution. They don't want to see Thomas Jefferson as a rapist. They want to see him as the author of the Declaration of Independence. They don't want to see George Washington as a slave owner. They want to see him as the patriarch of the United States. Traditionalists defend the Founding Fathers' ownership of slaves, often by remarking that within the context of the time, this was commonplace, unopposed, and the way of the world, and that judging men of the 18th and 19th centuries by modern 20th and 21st century standards is unfair. When slavery was finally abolished in the United States in 1865, not only was slavery abolished in much of the world already, but even serfdom, one rung above slavery, was largely a thing of the past. Traditionalists, upon hearing this, might move the goalposts and reorient the debate, and say that even if slavery was no longer the way of the world during, say, the presidency of James Madison, it was still the way of the United States of America. That is not true either, as free states and slave states divided on this issue. Many states opted for a kind of gradual abolition, and some outright abolished it. 
Traditionalists, upon hearing this, might reorient the debate again and say that even though half the country abolished slavery in the lifetimes of the Founding Fathers, it was still commonplace in slave states. That is more of a half-truth, as the full truth is more complicated. Most families in the United States were not wealthy enough to own slaves, or chose not to own slaves for other reasons, but it was still common in some slave states. Families who owned slaves ranged from a mere 3% in Delaware to a staggering 49% in Mississippi. So how common it was varied greatly. More importantly, normalization of a misdeed does not somehow make it no longer a misdeed. If half the population were murderers, it would not change the outcome of murder. If murder were legal, the victim would be no less dead if murder were illegal. Traditionalists, upon hearing all of this, might scramble to recontextualize slavery within its time. But the abolitionist movement began in the United States long before the Civil War, or even the American Revolution. It was not always a huge movement, admittedly, but to say that nobody knew better ignores the contributions of abolitionists from that era. Upon hearing all of this, traditionalists might reorient the conversation again and say that freeing slaves was not a commonly held belief in the United States. But you know who commonly held the belief that slaves should be free? Slaves. Saying not many people in the U.S. or in slave states thought slaves should be free ignores their opinions on their own enslavement. Their opinions should count. And since they made up half the population in some counties, it would be reasonable to say that freeing slaves was a commonly held belief by many people living in the United States. Upon hearing all of this, Traditionalists might try to reorient the debate once again, saying that the Founding Fathers did not know any better and were merely ignorant. But that is not true at all. As previously stated, people with power and wealth create racist policies for their own self-interest and sell this justification to people without power and wealth. The Founding Fathers did not just make some honest mistake about the rights of black people. They maintained slavery to hold on to their power and wealth. They maintained slavery out of self-interest. Claiming that hundreds of years of slavery was some kind of genuine misunderstanding and nothing else is a laughable and insulting argument. Upon hearing this, traditionalists may claim that some of the Founding Fathers had conflicting feelings about slavery, some of which they published. But we cannot judge people on their personal inner thoughts, only what they actually do. It was of small comfort to slaves that their masters may have wrestled with their consciences while still enslaving them. Finally, traditionalists might budge, but only in a way that reaffirms the glorification of the Founding Fathers. They may say that slavery was wrong, but since the Founding Fathers built the nation, this misdeed is outweighed. However, their building of the nation cannot be extricated from slavery because they used slavery to build their wealth, which in turn built their power. By using this argument, traditionalists are inadvertently promoting the notion of the ultimate good of slavery. Traditionalists try to defend the Founding Fathers by saying, Great men can have flaws, but their flaws were not forgivable or understandable indiscretions. They captured, enslaved, and raped people. Describing these misdeeds as mere flaws is a gross mischaracterization. Sometimes traditionalists will not go that far, though, and instead defend the Founding Fathers' ownership of slaves by walking a fine line. They don't want people to think they approve of slavery, only that the individual Founding Fathers were paradoxically not wrong to own slaves by using their favorite device, the past, the thing they fetishize. To them, slavery may be wrong now, but not wrong then, a moral relativism that is convenient to their goals, preservation of their cherished traditions. Slavery was no less slavery in the 18th century as it would be today.
So, what are the consequences to mythologizing the Founding Fathers and obfuscating their crimes with propaganda? First, it has the byproduct of social conservatism and even reactionary politics. Second, it helps to hide how the effects of slavery are still being felt today due to generational wealth. The descendants of slave owners profit from that inherited wealth and are therefore born into the upper class, and the descendants of slaves having far less or no generational wealth are born into poverty. Slavery in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries cannot be separated from segregation in the late 19th and 20th centuries, which cannot be separated from redlining and other things today. It's all connected. Third, it paints white men as the creators of the United States, and therefore worthy of greater consideration, whereas the truth is that much of the U.S. was quite literally built through slavery, though the descendants of slaves receive no such credit. Fourth, mythologizing the Founding Fathers as great men is an argument for constitutional constructionism. A position of seeing the United States Constitution as a perfect document that can only be interpreted literally and within the confines of the time it was written. No new rights or privileges can be awarded under a strict constructionist interpretation. Fifth, mythologizing and deifying the Founding Fathers leads to the legitimization of the argument, what would the Founding Fathers think? when confronted with modern thinking and social progress. Everyone is forced to pretend this is a real argument or else be labeled un-American. Sixth, glorification of the Founding Fathers is also glorification of the state and its monopoly of violence, the byproducts of which are often nationalism and xenophobia. Seventh, glorification of the Founding Fathers is essentially glorification of the wealthy, those who use the poor to their own ends. Due to the relative youth of the United States of America, exclusively American traditionalism generally only glorifies and mythologizes history reaching back to the late 18th century. There are exceptions, such as references to the Mayflower, veneration of Christopher Columbus, and the historical whitewashing that is Thanksgiving, but the popular consciousness of the United States and its traditions have their creation myth in the Founding Fathers and 1776. Because of this, counted among the United States' earliest traditions, its rituals, is capitalism, which began to emerge in earnest in the 17th century and transitioned from merchant capitalism, or mercantilism, to primitive manufacturing by the late 18th century, the time of the Founding Fathers. There are consequences to state mythology, consequences to traditionalism, and consequences to historical ignorance. If these facts make you uncomfortable, defensive and provoke the need for a retort. Ask these questions of yourself before doing so. Why am I so committed to defending wealthy slave owners? Are my cherished myths about the past really worth preserving if they actively harm people in the present? And finally, is this really the hill I want to die on? Will taking down monuments to Confederate generals, Christopher Columbus, and the Founding Fathers help chip away at a traditionalism that exists to impede progress and mask how past atrocities continue to affect people generations later? Maybe, for starters. But the forcible removal of monuments is not the end game. It's the rallying cry. It's the action that brings attention to hundreds of years of oppression and the state's whitewashing of that oppression. It's a public protest to shock people into paying attention to the form of state oppression that exists today among class and among race, so that we may finally rise up and do something about it.